Okay. Hey, welcome everybody to our 39th Open Clock Club from How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. I uh, hope you're all okay out there. We've got a rainy old day here in York with the uh, races are on. So everybody's dressed up nicely, but they're all looking regrettably like drowned rats. But anyway, we're in the warm and the dry. So uh, lovely to see you all. So uh, this uh, session that we run is to support beginners primarily in clock repair. But as you know, or many of you know now, uh, we've kind of gone off on many a tangent along the way. So the usual caveat, um, these sessions are recorded. So please keep your camera turned off if you want to remain anonymous. And uh, otherwise, we love to see you. And importantly, uh, remember this, if you're new to Zoom, there's a live chat feature and we would love to hear from you where you are, what you're doing, all that kind of thing. So please join in. I see the live chat's already fired up and we've got our very own team Open Clock Club across here who is uh, chatting to you all. So she'll fill in the gaps uh, or in fact uh, is the main show. Anyway, so over the next, uh, over the past few weeks, we have been working on a couple of fusey driven clocks and that's quite cool because it's raised a lot of uh, interest in things like uh, what line to use and importantly what spring you replace if the spring is broken and uh, we haven't really gotten to the bottom of that but at least we've done some kind of investigation and some discussion and hopefully it's got people thinking let's get a brush so last week uh, we it was one of those one step forward and 0.8 of a step back kind of weeks because uh, I got the majority of the uh, clock uh, assembled, started oiling it. And then there were two things. One, I realized that the pin, uh, I'm looking around for the clock, which I seem to have lost. I'll find it in a second. The pin in the fusee uh, that the chain hooks onto was had dropped out. And uh, so I kind of temporarily pushed it back in, but it was going to be unsafe. Uh, there it is. I spotted it lurking amongst all the rubbish on the bench. So let's just have a little move there just to bring you back up to speed. So here's our movement, all clean, washed. Um, find the key. That's the key. She's disappeared. I think this is too big. It's not great. Um, so when we look at the somewhere in here, there's the chain look hooked on to the end of the fusee. Let's just have a little focus. Uh, chain hooked on to the end of the fusee, and that pin that runs through the groove on the on the fusee had come undone. I put it on Facebook um, earlier this afternoon. So what I did was I. Uh, uh, took the fusee apart again and fitted a piece of blued pivot steel that I let down. I didn't think that a taper pin, just like soft iron, was going to be strong enough. I kind of, it would keep me awake at night, I think. So uh, I didn't need the hardness of blued steel, but I wanted that toughness. So I let the blued steel down by heating it to cherry red with my blowtorch, letting it, letting it cool slowly. And then I could just about file it. When you temper blued steel like that. It retains uh, some of those properties. It doesn't go completely um, completely soft. So anyway, if I, in here somewhere, if we can see it, it's hidden away. Oh, there, there, you might just be able to see it. If we get some light on it there, little pin. Anyway, I replaced that. It's on Facebook, some pictures of it. Um, and the other thing, uh, so that's, this is all done now. We got the frame together. We did, if you remember, our Fusey setup here. And in fact, it was Franklin last week who reminded me to put the pin in the setup ratchet. And I haven't done it again. So if I've still got it, which I might have chucked it out, I'll put it back. Otherwise, uh, oh yeah, maybe not. Maybe it'll turn up. It's been a busy old day with one thing or the other. And um, and so we have a bit of a shout out actually for uh, Tosh and Dell and Franklin who can't be here this evening, but they kind of sent their apologies. So we miss you both. 
Uh, we missed you, but hopefully you can catch up. So there's a pin to go through there. Uh, I'll grab one in a minute and, and pop one in. So otherwise, we're all done. And we oiled on the front plate only. I didn't oil the back plate because of it being down on the bench like this. I didn't want the oil to get sucked up by the paper. So we'll do that last. And you can see here, there's um, oil in the front of the fusey there, which is actually maybe a little bit much. So we've got about six clicks of setup on the fusey. So just kind of enough to get the stop the chain from uh, coming loose. Um, when we took it apart, it maybe had about a full turn on, was it 13 or something? But I'm just going to leave it at six for the time being, and I'll see how it goes as we run the clock. Remember, this has got an oldish main spring in. We don't know whether it's the original spring. It's 0 0.32 millimeters. Doesn't expand or develop massively when we took it out of the barrel, but I'm perfectly happy to live with that and see how it runs. If there's a, an issue with duration, then maybe we just wind the clock twice a week or something like that. But anyway, let's not um, preempt uh, any problem there. So that's all done. So the next thing was, now this is the other clock we've been working on. This is the line fusey. And you can see here, this is the uh, hour wheel, hour pipe. And on this clock, those two components are soft soldered together. So they're made as individual components that you can just see a bit of soft solder there, but they're soldered together in the factory or in the workshop and they stay together forever. Now, what this means is that when you put the hand on, or uh, when you put the both hands on, in fact, and assemble the motion work, there's the, let's say there's the hour hand, get it in the picture that way around. Um, you have to get the phase relationship between the cannon wheel, the minute wheel and the hour wheel correct. Otherwise, either at midday or at three o'clock or nine o'clock, uh, wrist won't rotate that much, um, the hands aren't going to be at right angles or in line. And that's uh, on a modern, my modern clock, like our Enfield clocks, what you do, of course, is the hand has just got a pipe on it that fits on another pipe, concentric pipe, and you just move the hand around to wherever you want. But as you can see on this, you can't because it's screwed in place. So, um, uh, so they have to be in sync when you assemble the clock, which is not a problem. Um, and in fact, on the chain driven fusey clock, I'll just get rid of a couple of gritty cobs, still some cobs in the teeth, but let's not worry about that. We, um, that one assembly that we've just seen is in fact three components here. There's the bit where the hand fits on. Uh, the pipe, if you like, which is undercut here, which is really nicely done. The hour wheel, and then there's the uh, slip washer here. And those three things, um, I'll get rid of the cobs in a minute. Those three things go together like that, he says, quite tight. And then what that means is this is the clutch. This is a simple clutch between the hour wheel and the hour hand. So it doesn't matter how you assemble the clock or the motion work, you just whack it together. And then when you've got the dial on, you just move the hand round and the hand moves independently of the wheel. Now that's all good and dandy, but um, what we found last week was that I think this component or this assembly had never been taken apart. And the, uh, the pin, i can just get it apart again, it's quite, a tight fit. You can see this has got holes drilled in it, these two components. So the pin that went through those two holes that held it together uh, was riveted. It was a brass rivet, actually, which maybe that's how they were when they were new, but it didn't appear to have ever been apart, which was fine, other than the fact that that old oil and old cleaning fluid in there um, had meant that the clutch didn't really work. You could just about turn it round, but of course, the problem with that is that um, it'll break the hour wheel teeth and you often see on these fusy clocks where the hour wheel teeth are damaged. So I said, shall we leave it? Just put some oil on. Um, and I can't remember, was it Jonas last week who said um, the problem with that? No. The problem with that is that if somebody comes along and they expect there to be a clutch there and they move the hand around, it might damage the teeth. And I thought, 
Well, I'm in the luxury position here of just get these gritty cobs out of the teeth. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm in the luxury luxury position here of having a bit of time and uh, tools and stuff at my disposal. I thought I will do that. So what I did was I center punched that pin, the rivet. Uh, I drilled it out, so drilled the hole right through the middle, then using a cutting brooch, just opened it up until the rivet came out. So it's done now. I was pleased that I was able to drill through the middle. It meant that um, uh, it meant that uh, the owl wheel and the slip washer weren't damaged more, but it also meant that that rivet has now gone. So we make that decision and we have to uh, live with it. So let's just have a little look at this assembly. Now I've brushed those gritty cobs off. Um, they're almost always like this. So this is the filed finish uh, when the thing's been filed from a casting and then the whole thing is assembled and then it's turned and then presumably the teeth are cut on it as well. So you always get this kind of filed finish underneath and then the turn finish on the outside. Really nice, really beautifully, competently made. And we can put some oil in here, but let's just try that friction because now we've got the uh, luxury of having the thing in bits and just get it so it lines up. Around there somewhere. There we are. So you can see through now mm -mm -mm, the hole. So that's all lined up. Let's just pop the hand on. I'll get some screwdrivers. Yeah. Uh, Yes. You recommend a single chain shop to practice on. Yeah. But the one that he's found has a balance wheel. So should he still practice on that one? No. Not if you're a beginner. Um, I mean, this is uh, an interesting question. The uh, if you if you if you start with the reason why we wrote our not the reason why we wrote our book, but the reason why we chose the clock for our book, which is lingering up there somewhere, the single train Smith Enfield clock doesn't have to be a Smith Enfield clock, can be an American clock, um, or uh, or any make of German clock, whatever it doesn't matter. But a single train going barrel clock is because that contains like. 90% of the terminology. Um, look, at, look at a clock like this, the mid 19th century clock. Look at a clock like the Enfield mid 20th century clock. Look at a Fromentil from the 1660s. 90% of the DNA is there. Um, unless you're going to set your mind on working on watches and carriage clocks, then I personally wouldn't go near a balance control clock, at least in the first instance because they're very different animals. Um, it, I think it's uh, interesting and courageous, the teaching institutions that often start by doing both, by doing watch type things and by doing pendulum clocks. And then students sometimes make a decision and they go down one route or the other. And that to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It, I can see it gives you a whole lot of flexibility. But what I also find is that people get massively put off by working on balance control clocks because inevitably the tolerances are smaller, the parts tend to be smaller. Sometimes you've got jewels, which is a whole new thing, whole lot of equipment and so on. I think uh, the beauty of doing a pendulum control clock single train is confidence building. You can kind of just do it, not massively complicated, get it together and say, right, I've got that under my belt. Now I'll do a two train, now I'll do a French clock, maybe then a few Z clock, maybe then a three train clock. And that's my sort of suggested progression. And then when you've got that stuff under your, under your belt, you know about depthing and bushing and how you wanna clean and setting in beat and refacing pallets and all those kind of everyday pro processes that we've talked about here, then say, right, do I want to work on carriage clocks or even watches, for instance? Because if you do, that's brilliant, but it's like starting again, uh, effectively, in my, in my opinion anyway. Uh, so massive amount of respect for people who work on both, but I would say, uh, no, don't, don't start um, on a balance control clock. I don't know, is Jonas here today? No. All right, okay. Um, we've got a, one of our, Facebook stalwarts, uh, Jonas, he just worked on an alarm clock 
with a balanced control. And um, there was, you know, a, a lot of work gone into, into that thing. And that's great, but it's already quite experienced. So that would be my strongest advice. Okay, so we've got this thing together now. And I'm just going to test how much friction, be easier if I held it around there, wouldn't it? There is a lot. You see the hand bending a little bit as I push it around. I mean, I haven't got any oil on it yet, but that to me is too much. And it's going to risk. It's really quite a lot of turning moment on there. So I'm just going to uh, flatten that spring a little bit just to reduce the friction. So I'll just take this screw out again. There. Don't want to lose that screw. Slip the slip washer off. And then this, so this spring here is domed. You maybe can't see it there, but it's ever so slightly domed. And that's where the system gets its friction from. A bit like the slip washer on the end of um, like a great wheel on a long case clock or something. So I'm just gonna flatten that a bit. So I'll just go get my raw hide hammer. Bear with me a minute. <laughs> so let's just do a bit of uh, gentle. So this is, um. One of my favorite hammers, it's uh, I think it's Buffalo hide or something, but really good for this kind of thing. Now, if you want a bit of um, extra protection on there, you could always put a bit of paper on top or thin card. Let's just have a look at that. See how it feels now. Hopefully that's, yeah, I can feel it's easier to slip on in the first place. Um, interestingly, although I washed this clock, not last week, but the week before, so at least two weeks ago, um, the uh, cleaning fluid was still wet between these two components. In fact, uh, it reminded me that um, when I cleaned uh, the Bull Swan Automaton, which I've got to mention every week, but anyway, bit boring. But uh, the point was that the cam in the middle is like a hollow drum. And when I took it apart, it was full, or not full, but it had all yucky, sort of still wet cleaning fluid in there because it hadn't been taken apart. And that was 40 years later on. So um, there we are, a lot easier to turn it now. So happy with that, but still more than enough friction to hold the thing. You can see actually that the hand, and it's often the case with this, it's not a fault. It's pivoting here around this screw, but it's actually quite big in relation to the um, in relation to the pipe. So you could put something in there, take that slop up, because it's going to obviously mean the hand can kind of move about a bit on the dial in relation to the uh, in relation to the uh, minute hand. Um, that's quite in. right. Okay. Uh, let's just take this apart yet again and put some oil on it. Doesn't need much oil because, of course, it re really doesn't move once the clock's set. You just set it. In fact, uh, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Should it be oiled at all? No, maybe not. No, maybe not. It doesn't need it. What I'll do is I'm just going to put a bit of Renaissance microcrystalline wax on there just so it's not quite so dry, sort of touching. But once the clock's set, it's only oil lubricated once. Or what I could use, so I'll get my wax again. Excuse me a second. So this would be a good case um, for putting a bit of micro crystalline wax on. Getting a bit grubby now. Um, or actually, you could use a dry lubricant, just like a pencil or something. So if I can find, not particularly well organized, but uh, that'll do. Oh, that'll do even better. Actually buy artist graphite pencils, which I don't think I've got one. Um, not enough pencils. But what I've got here, look, is just a very uh, soft pencil, a 6B. So I'm going to use that as um, you can see here where the pipe uh, rubs on their wheel. So I'm just going to put a bit of uh, graphite on there. 
and it'll just stop it from being quite so kind of squeaky when I fit the thing together. And we'll just put a bit up there as well, like that. Good. Pop that together. It's easier probably to line it up at the beginning, so I don't have to get the holes in line, like so. Won't go through the hole now. There we are. And Andrew says, why are you fixing the handle before the dial comes on? Oh, only for demo, taking it off again, just just a demonstration, that's all. And also to get a feel of the friction, because it's if you get the whole thing together and get the dial on, I'll get the movement on the dial, then you find out there's too much friction, you've got to take it all apart again. So just, just to do that. Okay, so we're going to pop a pin in there, and we are sorted. So again, I'm leaving you for the third time um, for a pin. Have a look. Might be one of these badges. This hole might be tapered. Um, off things often are, as is always often said in clocks. So let's just have a look. Fits through a certain amount one way, and yeah, fits through a bit further that way. So the pin, the the hole has been broached from the outside, from this side in. So that's great. Usual story. I'm just going to draw file the pin just to give it a bit of bite. And then I'm going to cut it to length and I'm not going to rivet. This is something we'll come on to in a, in a minute. Um, don't rivet the pins. You know what's going to happen if they're draw filed and tapped in. They do not need riveting. All you do by that is cause a big problem for the next person. This clock is not going to be flying at 30,000 feet. It's just going to be sitting on the wall. <laughs> Yeah. Right, so as always, I just get a needle file and I move that out of the way. Draw file, so I'm rotating in my fingers or in a pin vise. Draw file, draw file, draw file, like that. And then the pin won't drop out, or it'll tend not to drop out, out even. Let's just get John's vise. So yeah, it's been another uh, busy old week on Facebook. We seem to have got record um, a membership this week, you know, applications to join. I think it's like 800 now. Yeah. So we're going to be all being well at 1,000 by Christmas, which is really, really cool. Okay. Uh, brass hammer. And I'm going to leave this... Um, we know that if we look this side, we've got this washer and the pipe at the back, and uh, I don't think there's anything at this side that's going to get in the way. So I'm going to leave it about a millimetre either side sticking out. So the next person that comes along, they've got the easiest job in the world to tap it out. Um, no, no problem there. In fact, what you can do, and I might do it, yeah, I'll, I will do it as soon as I'm feeling this. Also. I was filing through, I was sawing through the blued steel before, so I've got a bit of my um, piercing saw is going to be completely blunt, but anyway, we can see under there. Just going to saw the pin off um, three millimetres too long. Ah, the blade's still got a bit of life in it, that's reassuring. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze this end of the pin so the next person who comes to the clock can obviously see that all they have to do is get some flat nose pliers on there, twist it and pull it out. You can't always do this because um, uh, there's some other component in the way and I might find something on this, but I think that's absolutely fine. So what I'm going to do is put it in the jaws of the vise and just squeeze the pin like this. Now I'm actually going to just use my bench vise, which is here and you can't see it, just because it's uh, a bit more meaty and it'll squish the pin together, hopefully without squeezing something else. 
So I don't know if you can see that. There you go. Just squeezed it in the vise. So the next person that comes along can just get flat nose pliers on it and pull it out. Easy, easy peasy. So this side, I'm just going to cut it off about a millimeter. So when you put the blade on to cut something like this, start the cut and then pull, let's turn the blade over the other way, pull the blade away from the work, then the edge of the blade won't damage the wheel. If you see what I mean, once it starts to cut, you can just move the whole saw sideways and the blade kind of goes like that, uh, or it might break. Say if you um, say if you're sewing onto the work. There we go. Right. So I've um, sewn through it here. If you want to tidy it up a little bit, and I suppose I should tidy it up. Maybe if I were doing it, otherwise I wouldn't bother. But just get a flat file and a bit of paper. He said nothing wrong for file. Wow, all these things I haven't got. I've been like preparing the whole day. Well, I haven't got the whole day, but I've been preparing like most of the morning and then of course I don't have anything I actually want. Uh, but anyway, hopefully it's uh, amusing rather than annoying. Just get some paper. My, bit of my photographic background paper here. Pop that on there. To protect the work you can see the uh, pin and then just file like that to file it flat make it look smart you see it glinting in the light get that off there keeps the swarf off and it just protects the edge so we're done there that's all assembled all ready to go back together so before i forget again uh, thinking about uh franklin no doubt his worrying about me and my pin. I'll just put another pin in here. I don't know what I'm going to do one. It's kicking around somewhere. So we just want a pin through here. Actually, this doesn't really need a pin. I mean, I think some clocks don't even have a hole through there, but um, let's just do it for the sake of argument because uh, once this is set again, it doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, however, better to be safe than sorry. It seems as of course you haven't got a file. I haven't got a file. <laughs> That is true. I haven't got enough files. In fact, that's made me feel slightly guilty about my filing video, which is like three months overdue now. Um, is that going to be next week? I, I kind of get a feeling that um, as we get further into unlocking uh, the, the sort of more commercial work, actually the bill paying work, um, it's going to get more and more as well. So I must get on crack on with those videos. So same thing. Let's just have a look and see if this is a brooched hole. It probably isn't in steel. No, it's not any different. It's a drilled hole. So let's just tap that in there. Brass hammer. A pair of cutters, which I don't have to run away from, regrettably. And just mark that. Jeremy says, yes, where is the filing video? Oh, I know, where's the filing video? It's only kind of two days work, but it's just like finding two days. It's pretty tricky. I should just knuckle down and do it. The thing is, I've, once I've done the filing video, I've got some really, in, what I feel are interesting videos to, to catch up with. And as much as um, uh, the, I'm incredibly grateful for people buying our book, which is great because that keeps the lights on. But uh, regrettably, that's about all it does. If you ever think about publishing a book, to make any money then forget it it's like a really good way to lose a lot of money but it's great fun so i'm not complaining but um so-called real work is also uh quite attractive at the moment i know i know i know <laughs> bitterly disappointed from um wherever ian lives the cotswolds or wherever it is disappointed from chichester where's the file video <laughs> I'm actually, <laughs> of course, the problem is I'm not actually sure it's going to be worth waiting for because it's one of those things that's a comparative test of uh, so-called cheap files and so-called expensive files. And I, yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a, um, what's the word? 
Nest. Some something nest. I forgot now. What is it? Ants nest. Is it? Nest of vipers. No, that's just Tim and Jeremy. <laughs> Hornet's nest. Worm nest, is it? <laughs> I've forgotten. Hornet's nest? Edmund says hornet's nest. Rats. Yeah. Rat. Rat nest. That's my hair. The hair's a rat nest. Okay, right, done it. Phew. There we are. Bit of oil on there. Uh, a little bit of um, oil on the pipe. That's all we need. Uh, on there, in fact, that would help. Make sure that the oil spread around. Um, you could use a bit of um, pith wood to apply the oil just to kind of spread it on rather than your oiler. Might help, doesn't need much. Or again, you could use your uh, graphite pencil on there. Any bearing where you've got a large bearing surface, because of course, the, even the um, if you're using synthetic oil, it's gonna dry up, evaporate and become sticky whereas I presume the graphite pencil won't. And there isn't much load per se, it's basically just uh, gravity on the uh, hour wheel. So there you go. Uh, that pin looks quite scruffy, but um, it'll mean that, as I said before, the next person has got a nice, easy life. So back to, um, yeah. Back to our minute wheel. Oiled this last week. I actually oiled it again uh, today. And that's kind of the reason I think, we, do you remember us looking last week for marks where this thing lined up like you'd find on a French clock or an earlier uh, sort of English clock? And the, I couldn't see any. And of course the reason is because it didn't matter. The, the maker hasn't bothered putting any marks in there because you just chuck it together and uh, away you go. Bob's your uncle, as they say. What does Matthew think about Molly Bedendum for dry lube? Yeah, for dry lube. Um, I, I don't know enough about it. I mean, the mainspring spray grease that I use has got molybdenum in it and Mobius D3, which I've used here, you just used it a second ago, also contains molybdenum. But as a standalone dry lube, I don't know is the answer. Um, maybe for these large bearing surfaces are slow moving. I don't see why not, um, but I wouldn't go for it for pivots at all. I do think you need a liquid uh, lubricant there for those kinds of bearings, but certainly where you've got a large area like a star wheel and jumper, and you don't want that to attract a lot of, um, but it's a good example. I don't know whether uh, many people know that mechanism on some spring clocks and carriage clocks where the snail is mounted on a star and rather than it moving with the hour wheel, it jumps every hour. There, you've got very light loaded bearings that move in frequently, large surface area, and I'm not an engineer or a tribologist, but I kind of think that that would be a good place for something like a dry uh, lubricant. In fact, that's what I use. I use my uh, graphite pencil uh, there. Right, the screw, which is so that one. Cut away screw. And um, so just a bit of oil on the uh, minute wheel pivot there. Why the cutout screw? False plate. This clock's got a false plate, um, believe it or not. Uh, that I've never seen that on a fusee clock before. When we first saw it, I thought, mm, that's a bit dodge. But um, uh, I think that's what uh, we agreed it was for. However, the way I've timed it up, of course, it doesn't uh, suit that. You will see in a minute, because we're going to whack it onto the um, uh, patented Type 3 a test stand, of which I'm such a great fan. Um, I think that's what it's for, Rob. It's for uh, clearance on a false plate. But as I said, the way I've tightened it up, I don't think it's in the right position anyway, but we will see in a second. So let's whack this on the uh, test stand just to kind of, um, yeah, what we're gonna do. 
maybe not much point in winding yet. Now I will wind it. So I'm going to put the pallets in. Uh, and the reason I want to put it on the test stand, I think, or maybe not, is I don't want it resting on the chain here. I mean, this surface is uh, lino linoleum and then paper, so I think it's quite soft, but I don't want it kind of resting on the chain on the bench and gathering up all kinds of uh, grit and muck and stuff there. So let's just pop the pallets in, only to prevent the train from running through when we begin to wind the chain onto the fusee. So we want to wind the chain onto the fusee at least once, and then we know that when it runs down the next time, the chain is going to be in the right place. Now, as I said before, this is potentially dangerous because if that chain breaks for any reason, it is going to flail around and it could hurt your eyes or your face or your fingers. So you're going to wear safety gloves and goggles as well. However, let's just get our Barry Backcock on. Um, there we go. Oh, and the screw there as well, which wants tightening up, doesn't it? I've forgotten that. The last one. So let's just remember, I kind of half assembled this uh, last week. Have I got the pallets on the correct way around? Escape wheel is running anti-clockwise there. Yes, I have. Sort of... Um, Moderately embarrassing to screw the pallets on and then be back to front. Although I've known worse. There we go. And again, a bit like the hour hand I showed on the hour pipe, the hole here is often kind of quite sloppy for these pallets. So it's important that that screw is uh, quite tight. Otherwise, you will lose impulse. So I'm not going to put any oil on the pallet faces yet. And these pallets are a bit grooved, but we're just going to see how it goes. Let's just actually get it so you can see. Um, because I'll just show you. If you look, at, it's slightly confusing here. Let's just zoom in because when you look at the escape wheel, you will notice that it doesn't kind of look like your regular um, anchor recoil escape wheel that's got curved leading edges. I don't probably have one actually no, available at hand. Um, this looks like either a deadbeat or more importantly a half deadbeat escapement where you would expect the wheel to rotate in this direction so with leading edges that are facing forwards but it's not. This is an anchor recoil escapement that happens to look like a half deadbeat escapement so the uh, Click. So the wheel is rotating counterclockwise as we're looking at it here. It's going in this direction. And so when I look at my pallets, here they are, they go the same way. This is your entry pallet here, uh, acting surface. You can see it's a bit grooved underneath. And this is the exit pallet here. So if I screwed them on the other way around, inside out, the wheel would be going in this direction. But in fact, the wheel is going in this direction, entry pallet and exit pallet. So it's interesting um, little, it can catch you out that whole half beat, half dead beat escapement escape wheel because the pallet, the escape wheel then would rotate in the other direction. And I don't know whether they made these wheels all the same for those different kind of clocks. Um, who knows, kind of easy to conjecture, I suppose. So let's just pop those screws. Says, is that the proper escape wheel or is it a marriage? No, proper, proper escape wheel for this clock. Yeah, it's always been like that. Remember an escape wheel is uh, basically a set of dots or points in space. The stuff, the shape of the teeth uh, on this kind of clock, all they do is they hold those points in space or lines, little lines in space in place. So I presume they were making uh, half dead beat clocks and uh, anchor recall clocks together in the same place, just made one escape wheel for both kinds of uh, escapement, I guess. But again, uh, pure conjecture. Jeremy says, are you going to straighten the clutch? Uh, eagle eye, Jeremy. <laughs> yes, yes. Well spotted, Jeremy. Just checking you are still, a, still awake. Am I going to straighten the clutch? Yes, of course. Wouldn't ever leave it like that. Uh, so these... <laughs> These clocks have got a brass crutch 
uh, for beat setting. There isn't like, a, unlike a modern clock or a regulated type clock, there isn't any beat setting on the crutch. It's all solid. Uh, and as you can see, it's been bent one way, then bent the other way. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Bit of straightening in order. Let's just get a bit of uh, boxwood or something like that. This will do. Brush handle, beech wood. So it's a decent bit of uh, hardwood. And let's just maybe do I have the right hammer? Actually, the, the best hammer for this, which is what I don't have, is a jeweler hammer like this. It's got a fiber, red fiber end. You know the uh, fiber jaws on these vice protectors? You can get a hammer with an adjustable end like that, but with a wooden oval handle. Really cool. It's brass one end and fiber the other. Probably the perfect uh, tool for this job. Uh, it's pretty soft, is this crutch? So it should, should straighten up yeah. re relatively easily. He's just done one like that that had been dropped, so it's fresh in his head. All right, thank you, Jeremy. I'm so pleased to have all these extra pairs of eyes and extra consciousness, consciousnesses as well. So when you've straightened a crutch like that on a long case clock or an end clock, in fact, the next thing to do is to check that the crutch pin or the crutch slot or the crutch loop and the axis of the arbor are parallel because often they get twisted, which can cause you problems. So we want to look here. And we can notice that this isn't quite parallel. The pin is just uh, twisted a little bit. So just twist it back. A bit more. It's really soft. But that's actually a really important part of the process um, that you get those two things running parallel. Uh, not that they necessarily were and have to be, but it's just nice to start with it like that. And then, of course, if your back cock slot for a long case clock where you've got a, like a regular thin suspension spring, oops, sorry about the camera, regular thin suspension spring is cut at an angle, then you have to change that pin accordingly. But it's just a lot easier to do that when it's already in the clock. Andrew said, would you set the beat by adjusting the pallet screw? No, no, that's, that's fixed. You set the beat by bending the crutch. Um, or, of course, with a clock like this, you can set the beat by um, the position of the uh, case on the wall. I mean, as Jeremy's got us to straighten the crutch, you might think that uh, with the, the wall, with the clock plumb, as in a line between the uh, 12 o'clock numeral and the 6 o'clock numeral, it would be in beat, but the chances are it won't because these things were sort of like back that's produced. So no, bend the, um, bend the crutch. That's what it's designed to do. Or move the case around on the wall. You do often find with these dial clocks so that the three or four, three I think, um, dial retaining screws th uh, strip, the wood screws. And so what people do is they tend to, rather than plug and glue and redrill the holes, they just move the dial around a little bit which is fine, but it means you've got to put the clock in beat and then you've got the whole case is a little bit skewed uh, on the wall. Okay, so I'm just going to look for the so-called proper, so-called better key. I think is, oh, there it is, Miracle. There we go. Just give it a bit of a wind. And just check that there's power through to our escape man. That's a good opportunity for us to have a preliminary look at drop on our skip. I'm not going to just warm the camera up a bit. Um, I'm not going to obsess about drop on this. It's actually not too bad at all. Um, cool. So drop for uh, starters is the free 
angular movement of the escape wheel and therefore the or the unimpeded angular uh, rotation of the escape wheel and therefore the rest of the train in between phases of impulse so the escape wheels uh providing adding energy to the pendulum via the pallets and the crutch by pushing the pallets and um uh, in between the exit pallet and entry pallet or entry pallet and exit pallet uh, there is a tiny bit of free movement of, of free rotation, unimpeded rotation of the escape wheel and the train, and that is called drop, and it's lost energy. So without obsessing, you want to keep drop to a reasonable minimum, but that means adding material by soldering or gluing on uh, a piece of material to the pallet base, which we've done in this series, and we've also done on our live stream there, so you can find that information there. Okay, so remembering... Uh, I might just dial that front pallet arbor pivot. Just pop that on there. Can't really see Ooh, too much. Just so we've got the back plate to do that. So, so remembering that uh, we've still got the back plate to oil, so I'm not going to run the clock. I'm now going to, and I'll get to the best position so you can see, which is maybe something like that. Um, I'm now going to wind the clock, so I'm just going to find my safety glasses. Um, hopefully you can, I don't think there's necessarily a sort of better angle that I can hold the clock at. That's as good as we're going to get, I think. Um, so I'm just going to wind the clock and I'm going to watch the chain as it runs onto the fusee. Okay, this might be like the biggest sort of like um, we've seen on Open Clock Club yet, but I hope not, obviously. Just get my gloves on. And what I'm going to do is if the chain uh, begins to deviate from the groove on the fusee, I'm just going to guide it with my brass tweezers, which are here. So, so I'm just going to guide it onto the uh, onto the groove there, but I think it'll be okay. As I said last week, one of the many advantages of washing the clock in this spirit uh, rather than refinishing it is that you can still see the marks where the fusee chain ran on the barrel before. But as you can see here, it's a little bit crooked. Um, it's not exactly evenly spaced, so we can kind of just adjust it a little bit. But anyway. So I'm going to take that off and keep this on. So I'm going to wind it really carefully and just watch. Ah, oh, you heard the spring there. There's the spring kind of settling down. Now, if the chain tends to run up a little bit or rub on this side of the fusee, that's kind of not such a big deal. You don't need to ride up. But if it begins to ride up on this side or the open side, then that is uh, potentially disastrous because if the chain rides up and then it falls over, it might break and then all the energy in the uh, spring will be released instantaneously. So when we get towards the top, remember we've got 16 half turns of the fusee. The fusee's got, fusee got eight, uh, yeah, 16 turns of it. Sorry, we've got 32 half turns. My mental math is abysmal as always. So that's half a turn of the fusee per day of running. That's eight days in total. Um, keys are terrible fit, and you remember me knocking the burrs down before. We're going to right, okay. So I think that's sorry. Is it blocking the view? Regrettably, I've also got to see it. Thank you. So um, a quick uh, quick fire question here. What is the next thing that we're going to be keeping an eagle eye on? First one to the 
answer gets a special prize. Mystery prize, which we doesn't exist. Come on, quick, 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 quick. Thank you, Jeremy. Well done. Uh, that would be uh, a thing. Right, okay. Says stop high end. Stop high end. Well done. So it's beginning to run up. So I'm just going to try and slide it across a little bit because it's uh, just riding up on the chain side, which isn't the end of the world, but I would prefer it not to. Now, obviously, you want to try avoiding doing this because um, it scratches the barrel. Now you can see the chain runs across here. So I think it's going to get worse as we wind it, unfortunately. But you can imagine now, and this is the this is the earlier spring, so it's not massively strong. Terrible noise. It's gonna encourage that over so you can just about see in there the chain is beginning to touch the stop iron but it hasn't activated it yet in the sense of there's still one full turn to go now the chain is running up a little bit there but it i'll just use my tweezers you maybe can't see them just to push the chain across to stop it making that terrible sound but it won't do when uh, the clock runs down so this time yeah, there we go. Stop iron is engaged. All good. So we're done. So the clock is now slightly regrettably fully wound, uh, but I'm happy that the stop iron works. Okay. And we can just check. We just get the clock in beat or something down here. Trusty hammer. Too thick. Oh, it's back into the screen. All good. Very sweet. All nice. All good. Okay. Let's, uh, how we do for time? 53. Let's just pop it into the test. I know you're all desperate to see the test stand. I need to have a bit of a tidy up. A tidy up using the term incredibly loosely, of course, advisedly. <laughs> basically pushing things to one side. Um, whatever you're saying to um, Team Open Clock Club is keeping us all laughing at this end anyway, so thank you. So here it is. Whoops, better not destroy anything. So you like a test stand. So what I've done is um, it's, it's I only made this because of Open Clock Club. Normally, of course, I've already got the best purpose-made test stand in the world for this clock, and that's the case that it's actually meant to go in. However, uh, I knew you want to see this. So I put some plaster soap foam behind the dial and then some more foam under these horrible, not horrible, but uh, posi drive screws um, that are holding the dial in place. So there we go. Good. Is there a way you can get better view than stuff I Um Yes, maybe. Let's have a look here. Um, just get the light in there. Let's just have a little. Oh, there we are. So uh, hopefully that is doing it for you. Keep on. David said, "How many turns should the spring be wound to keep the tension on the chain to start with?" Again, uh, I just put six clicks of stop. That's half a turn to begin with. I'll see how the clock runs. I'll use. Um, I just keep a. a, a an idea on the rate. I'd rather have less than more. Um, I think it'll run down into that half turn if necessary, and it gets to the bottom and it stops before it's run out. Then I'll just put a bit more setup on. So six half a click of um, half a turn of of setup, and you saw that the spring didn't come to the top. So in terms of the stop iron, kind of slightly <laughs> mutant pointy stick. Uh, so you see the chain here running between the barrel and the fusee. That wants to be moved across a little bit. It, it's too far uh, across this way, but 
I'll deal with that later. Um, I don't really want to scratch the barrel. That's the thing. I'm happy for it to just find its own position. Anyway, uh, so as the chain moves in this direction, as it runs from the barrel to the fusee, filling up, filling up, filling up, the stop iron here is sprung away from this piece on the front of the fusee, the fusee stop piece. And you will notice that the stop iron is cut back. There's an angle there. And there's a similar angle here on the uh, stop piece. That's as far as my camera will zoom in. So when those two things come together, the minute they engage, you can see that they're actually pulled into engagement to make a really positive uh, stop there. Okay, hope that helps. And then the spring, when the clock unwinds, by the time the fusy stop piece comes around again, the stop iron on the spring has moved away, so it's completely, uh, completely clear. Okay, so let's just have a look at this. I'll try and you have a look at this incredible joy. That is my test stand. So many lights and stuff. Um, so I've, I cleaned this by vacuuming. Uh, I did a bit of a video on washing the dial. Uh, so I've started to wash the dial with um, some deionized water with a little bit of Vulpex soap and about 3%, give or take, isopropyl alcohol in there just to lift off some of that uh, dirt, which it did rather nicely, but obviously leaving the numbers in place. And then I vacuumed, basically just vacuumed uh, the back of the dial and somewhere, uh, I haven't got to vacuum the case yet, but we were in town a couple of days ago or yesterday in fact, and I treated myself to a new, I haven't taken the wrapping off it yet, but a new uh, brush for vacuuming into the corner of um, uh, clock cases. So I wanted a nice long brush, natural bristle brush, and really importantly, with a wrapped ferrule, so you don't have that metal ferrule that's going to cause scratching. So this is really nice. You can obviously do this yourself, putting a bit of cotton tape around, uh, around that. So that was my little treat. So let's get this badger on here. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting uh, about that screw. I don't know what that cutaway screw is for because it doesn't go anywhere near the false plate. But anyway, there you go. So um, just put a pin in there temporarily. I'll draw file a couple more, pop them in. And then our next challenge, if we can just get, if the camera decides is it's, yeah, focusing as well, um, is that we need a new uh, suspension spring. So I think that's going to be next week, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be next week. Good timing. So. I think on a live stream, our tall case clock, we already made a suspension spring and maybe we made one on this channel. I can't remember, it all seems to be a bit of a blur now. Um, but the difference here is that the spring doesn't just fit in the slot. You can see the slot's quite wide. It's about two millimeters. So the top uh, suspension spring top block and the spring are embraced by the back cock. And that's gotta be a good fit. Doesn't wanna be tight. Uh, the pendulum and the spring must be able to assume a vertical position, uh, but they also don't want any slop in there. Otherwise, the whole thing kind of yeah slops about and is um, unpleasant and maybe also affects timekeeping. So there are two ways. I'm just going to take that pin out and put my draw filed one in. There we go. Give it a bit of a tap. Locks trying to tick. And then a couple more down here as well. Um, so there are two ways of dealing with this suspension spring. We'll do it next week. One is to get a bit of material and fold it over, a bit of brass, so it's a good fit in here. And the other one is to get a bit of solid brass and file a slot, um, saw a slot in it for the spring and then file down the edges of the material so it's a good fit. Now you kind of get a better looking result with that in a, in the sense of it being sort of a nice bit of block of material, um, but it's more difficult. It's a lot easier to fold a piece of material around. So might have a go at at least demonstrating both 
uh, can't see the. There it is. It's hiding. Like we did it said, do you normally tap all the pins when putting it together? Yeah, yeah. I always tap the pins in with my uh, lucky brass hammer. Yeah, I do. Um, rather than, uh, it's a good point, rather than push them in uh, with a pair of pliers or something, yeah, I just give them a little tap. Oh, there we are. Um, you often see them overdriven in there, and of course it splits the post or whatever it is, which is uh, unpleasant as well. So yeah, really, as you know, I mention it every week, really love that brass hammer. It's just so incredibly useful. Let's have a look around here. Andrew said, what do you use to cut the suspension string to length? Uh, I snap it, uh, either snap it or get um, a pair of flat pliers or the vise, which has got plain jaws and just bend it over and it, and it snaps and then grind the end. I think that's really important uh, with a stone, like an Arkansas stone or a, a ceramic stone or something otherwise you've got that burr there and that burr often causes a problem and very few people in my experience um bother doing that bother finishing the end of the spring so yeah i just snap it off don't cut it punch a hole in it um and then punch another hole for the suspension so just before we go Yeah, it could do. You could use your boxwood mallet, which we've got somewhere here. Um, yeah. There we are. Boxwood. Great. Love it. Um, and as I said, the, I'll try and dig out one of those fibre ended hammers. They're really cool. Maybe, um, what do they call them? Maybe this company saw, uh, still make one. I don't know. I'll try and dig one out for next week. So that's where we've got to. So quite a nice little result this week. Uh, let's have a look. So we've got our clock, uh, it's trying to tick, fully wound, no oil on the back plate yet, so I'm not going to run it because uh, before we make any further progress, sorry, I've disappeared off the edge of the screen, uh, we need to make a suspension spring. It's a little bit dull because we've done it all before, but I'm really happy to go through it again. Here's our pendulum rod, typical fusee rod. The uh, bottom bit rating thread is bent, which is easy to straighten up. Uh, and then we've got the curse here of the pin that's been put in and riveted over. You don't need to rivet the pin over. It just makes it difficult for the next person, which is us. And a bit of corrosion as well. So I've been soaking this in turpentine. So they pushed the pin in, riveted it over, like, oh, that really is quite annoying. But anyway, um, and then we've got to determine how long the spring is going to be. There's a wear mark on the pendulum slot, which we're going to look at, but I'm probably going to ignore that because we've also got marks here, um, look, uh, scratched on the pendulum rod. Um, oh, I've got to be careful what I say now, but <laughs> one of the very first lesson I had in repairing a clock, the person that, told, that showed me how to do it, uh, bless them, said, scratch at the top of the pendulum bob so you know where to put it back and scratch around the back cock so you know where to put that back as well don't do that just go from first principles uh, anyway that was a long time ago so good so i think uh, realistically we can knock a suspension spring out next week we can get it on here um if i had one of those clever timing machines like we could run it to time but who cares uh, and we'll get the hands on so thank you very much to team open clock club there's our lovely dial and um, test stand. Ta -da! And uh, thank you all on Facebook group for your constant help and support and encouraging beginners to get started, uh, to not sucking through your teeth, not saying there's a proper way to repair a clock, because as we know, there isn't. There's no wrong, right, should, have to, or must. So thank you very much. Hope you all have a brilliant weekend. Really great to see you all. Super big thank you to Team Open Clock Club, who seems to have been smiling the whole way through. So you must have been saying something more entertaining than I have. So that's uh, well done. And thank you. Uh, if we don't see you um, on Facebook during the week, we'll see you same time, 1800 hours British summer time next Saturday for doing the suspension spring. OK, bye for now. Thanks very much. <laughs>